Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paul Hotzinger. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, and I'm a Portman maintainer and Netherwork and Otherwork DNS maintainer, which are our network tools, which you will learn more about now. And the first thing you need to know about Portman are so-called network modes. So we separate uh, our different kind of network configuration in groups, where there's the host mode, uh, very simple, there's no isolation whatsoever, it's just using your host network. The opposite of that is none, it's creating a name, network namespace and uh, there's only a loop loopback interface in it, there's no network connectivity for the container in that case. Then there's the container mode that allows you to join one container to the existing namespace of another container. So in this case, then both containers would share the same namespace and they could also communicate via localhost. That is what we use for pod networking, for example, where they all can just communicate via localhost. The next one would be NSPath, which is basically just you give us the network namespace you want. It's uh, very flexible because you can configure a network namespace with any tool you want, like IP NetNS is the standard utility. Do what you want and give it to your container. But the real work that Portman can do is in the other network modes, Bridge, also known like the custom networks, Slope for NetNS and Pasta. More about that now. So a bridge as network mode is a bit confusing as a name because it implies the use of a bridge interface, but internally in Portman, what it really means are custom networks. These are managed by the Portman network command. And the Portman network commands are like Portman network LS, just shows your, your networks. Portman network create to create one. Portman network inspect, you can see data and some more. And by default, we always have a Portman network which will be used if you specify like the dash dash network bridge option to like Portman run to run a container. Or like you can give us a name of a network like dash dash network mynet. And the, the confusing part here is that each network itself has a driver. And the standard one is bridge, which is uh, very uh, universally because it's it's basically works out of the box, which is why it's the default for rootful networking. But there are also other drivers such as MacVLAN and IPVLAN that map to the corresponding kernel interface type. And they are a bit more special, more about that later. And you can even write your own plugin. Uh, we are an extra plugin architecture in Netherwork. And here you can see a example config. Sorry. So that's a Portman network inspect output. See some metadata name ID, which driver, a network interface name, like does it have DNS and so on. And all of this. It will be managed by Netherwork. So Netherwork is the tool to actually configure a network namespace for the container. And this is, works very simple. It's like a network setup command that is launched by Portman if you start a container. It, Portman sends over all the data, like the, the metadata you just saw and like additional uh, metadata for each container. And then Netherwork does basically the setup. And the same on a stop, you do the teardown uh, opposite with the same metadata. It removes the, the interfaces again and like IP allocations. And the important part here is you can use one to n networks. So you are not limited to a single network for a container. You can use several different ones, which is different from the normal network modes that we have, like something like network host fundamentally incompatible with like network none or something. But with uh, network networks, you can combine them as you like. 
which can be quite useful. And so how does a bridge driver in NetAvac actually work? What does it do? So as the name implies, it creates a bridge on the host and then it uses a so-called WEF pair. That's a, also a kernel interface type. You can think of a WEF pair as a bidirectional pipe and the pipe basically means what you send in on, on the one end, it comes out on the other end in terms of network packages. And with that, you can connect one end on the host to the bridge, and the other end will be placed into the container. So that way, we can send the packages between the namespaces. But you also need to go to the outside if you want to connect to the local network or internet. So in this case, by default, like we have a different subnet for the container that wouldn't be routable without additional network configuration. So by default, it sets up a network, a net to translate the source IPs to allow like external communications, like your average home router does here. And the same way, we can use uh, DNet rules to translate incoming traffic for port forwarding. So you can map your port 80 to port 80 to a container so the host port is redirected into the container. So let's show some quick example how that can look. So first we can create a network via Podman network create and you give it a name, that one. Let's create a second one. Yes. If I find the key combo, that's better. Uh, we can inspect it real quick. So yeah, you see the metadata, we have a subnet 10.890024. And we also have uh, DNS enabled. And now we just run a container, give it a name real quick, and then say like network net one. Yep. Thank you. Just spawning like shell real quick. Can show you the IP address in the container. So let's do another container. Let me make the font size a bit bigger. And this time I'm going to connect it to a second network. Show you. So this time you will see two interfaces in the container. You see their IP addresses for each of the network basically. And I can show you an example where we can for once show external communication. So that seems to work fine. And if I go back to the first container, we can even ch check the DNS. So C2 is the name of the other container, and we get the address. We can even ping that address if we like. So that works. And that's how containers can communicate between each other. You can use the names if you have the DNS enabled on the network. And that way you have quick communication. I can even show you the quick. So that's too big. Uh, so you have a WEF interface. You see that the name WEF2. The Portman 2 is the bridge interface for the second network, WEF1, WEF0. WEF so you have like three WEF pairs on the host because we have like three interfaces in the container, like one in the first and two in the second. 
and Portman 1 is the first bridge. And that way it's all mapped. So let's jump back. So how can this look? A bit more cleanly, try to condense this into one diagram. Basically, what we just saw, I added a, another container. Not sure why I called it four. <laughs> and sorry. So you see the bridges here connected to, via the web pairs to the containers. And these are like two separate networks, like this is the one network, this is another one. And we use like the firewall rules. So Netherwork has uh, different firewall drivers. So currently we still use IP tables by default, but we recently added NF tables as well. And we are planning to switch the default over to NF tables as it's the better firewall backend, the newer thing in the kernel, and it's just more feature rich and much faster to use. And yeah, you see the pop commands that something like that maps to that. So yeah, I just showed you on the demo like DNS is working between containers for bridge networks. You can resolve like all the names on your network and Netherwork will automatically spawn up the other rack DNS, which is a DNS server. And once there are no more containers that need DNS, it will automatically stop to no longer eat up resources or blocking the ports. And it will bind to the bridge IP in the, in the host namespace on port 53. So, and Portman then adds the uh, correct address to resolve.conf in the container. Uh, I also talked a bit, uh, showed you the Mac VLAN IP VLAN driver before. So you would create a network via the dash dash driver argument. You can say Mac VLAN or IP VLAN. And the main difference is that, so these are like kernel interface types. And the Mac VLAN interface basically redirects the traffic from a, from a host physical interface directly into a container and creates like a, a child interface. And it uses this by creating a second MAC address. And then like the traffic is directly routed into the container namespace. And because of that, it's sort of like a layer two directly attached to your local network, which means you can use DHCP to assign an address to a container. And that's what the D Netherwork DHCP proxy does. And it will just grab the lease address from your local DHCP server. And that uh, DHCP functionality does not work with IP VLAN because IP VLAN doesn't use a different MAC address to separate the traffic, but uh, only a different IP address, which, which means like uh, since DHCP is working on MAC addresses, uh, there's no way to, uh, for the server to see a difference, and it would give you the same IP, which is not good. And the, yeah, the problem with that is no port forwarding supported because we have like no firewall and like it's bypassing the host namespace. Like there's no way to forward a port into the container. But if you want that, you can still use a bridge network and a Mac VLAN network. Like I showed you, you can use two networks. It's no problem. So now rootless networking. I think that's the more interesting part. Like before, it's all like kernel stuff, we just configure it. And with rootless networking, we have a problem. It is unprivileged. We cannot create interfaces on the host. We cannot create firewall rules on the host. And we don't use set your ID or like a privileged daemon to do that for us. So how does that work? Well, what we can do is we can create an interface in a network namespace in a that was created inside our unprivileged user namespace, which is used by a rootless portman for like basic, for basically every functionality that enables these rootless containers. And inside these namespaces, it means if you can create an interface there, you can use the a tub interface, which is a kernel driver, which creates like an interface that is connected to a pro process, and the process can send. Like packages uh, into the top interface or read 
from the top and back. So this is what it gets. And if you can do this on one side, but you can do like every unprivileged process, everything that does networking, you can use layer four sockets. You can open a TCP socket and try to connect somewhere. It will get routed. So the idea is that you have a process that connects the tab interface to layer four sockets on the host. And that way you can proxy all your networking out. So the one process that does this is Slurp for NetNS, which is, like I said, uh, it's a running, like external running process. It used to be our default for like rootless networking. And it uses like a static subnet in the container to assign like an address and everything there will be like it's routed into the tab interface and then it creates like the corresponding layer four socket on the host makes makes the request and does it. It doesn't have very good IPv6 support, so it's uh, considered experimental in their docs. Uh, it sort of works, maybe not as good. And uh, what it ca cannot do is it cannot do port forwarding for IPv6. So that is why we have another external process called uh, rootless port. And rootless port is uh, basically it's very similar, it just binds the port on the host and then it sends to the port in the namespace. So it's, it's a direct proxy. But the problem is that because of it's like, it's opening the socket on the host, it's reading there, and then it's opening the socket in the namespace and piping the, the, the raw data, it's creating like new packages. And these new packages have a no source IP from within the container. So if you run something like a web server, you look, at, look into your logs, rootless, you will see, oh, that's, this IP address isn't like a public IP address where the request came from. So that's a problem if you rely on such data. Now, Pasta does like sort of the same thing. It's also like a running process. And it's the default since 5.0. And it functions a bit different than and slurp for NetNS, that by default it tries to do no net, which means it's looking what IP address do you have on your default interface on the host, and it sets it to the, to the same one in the container. And like it uses the same like tap interface trick to send the traffic, but it means since the IP is the same in the container and the host, like if you try to connect to your host IP, that would actually be the container in this case, like from from that point. It's very confusing in, in that regard if you don't know about that. But it has much better IPv6 support. It's well supported. It's also faster than Slope for NetNS. It has some some tricks that it uses. And the, the port forwarding for it, it preserves the original source IP, which is very good. And now the problem with both Slurp for NetNS and Pasta is like they isolate each container individually and they don't allow the communication between containers, what I showed you before with the bridge mode and the host, which is very standard functionality people expect for, from their stacks. If you use your compose stack or something like that, they will always try to like a DB container and the, and the web server and they use the names. So how, how can we do that, that's the question. And the idea there was, well, we know we have Slurp for NetNS and Pasta, and we know we have this bridge set up. Why can't we combine them? And that's exactly what we do. Podman can, instead of creating like a container namespace where Pasta and Slurp for NetNS will get connected, they, uh, Podman has an intermediate namespace. I call this the rootless NetNS. And the idea is to connect this namespace, we are passed on slope for NetNS, and then inside the rootless NetNS, we call the NetArc setup and teardown commands that will create a bridge in this interface, connect REFs to the containers. So how does this look now? So this part should be clear. So that's what we saw before, basically, except that we don't have our host interface here, we have the interface and all the traffic 
get through this process back to the host namespace. And that way, we have a very easy way to support this kind of scenario because we can just reuse what we already have. There's no additional work or like magic happening yet. Some magic happening in the rootless NetNS to make that work. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's like minor things like configuring a correct like resolve.conf and it's not, not that important. Uh, the one main issue here is before we use like DNet rules here to forward a port like, like that, right? Now, if you make a request, you come in here, right? So how do we get the port out? Well, there comes back our rootless port forwarder because that's a direct proxy between a host and the container namespace. So that way, every container has its own process for the port forwarding, if it has ports forwarded. The issue, as I mentioned uh, earlier, rootless port doesn't preserve the source IP. So here, this is something we are, want to address in, in the future, but it's not so clear how, how we can achieve that. So one idea would be to try to forward the ports like into here and then we are pasta, which does preserve the source IP and then get here into the DNet. It's, it's uh, unfortunately not very simple to, to do so because then we all of a sudden have like a one-to-end relationship with port forwarding in this process, which unfortunately uh, is not the case today, but I'm working on that. And uh, with that, I, I'm done. So thank you. If you have any questions, now is the time. Which one? Like the last one? So if you run rootless, yeah. The, the question was how to do that on, uh, like how to connect that to the container. So it functions exactly the same way as rootless. You just are rootless and you do the same thing. Hotman run network like switch. And then I just change the IPs. So it got like a bridge IP. And it's pink something. And so there's one neat debug trick that I can show you. So the, the rootless NetNS, you can enter it like this. And now you see, the, in this case, the tab interface of Slurp for NetNS. And if I run another container, So now you see the bridge in this rootless NetNS. All right, other questions? Yeah. So the problem for rootless is that since we only have like one group for NetNS or past, uh, the question was, why is the bridge not the default for rootless? So first of all, there's some historical reasons, like the, the bridge mode got introduced much later and we didn't want to change defaults. And the second issue is the, the source IP port forwarding. And generally, it goes through the one 
faster or slip for an NS process, which can, if you have really like high throughput, it can be a bottleneck. This this one process, if you, it's a user space process, it takes CPU. So. But eventually, it would be cool if we can get bridge. Like, if you have the source IP problem solved, I think we like to aim to make that the default because then rootless, rootless networking would behave the same as rootful networking by default. And another question might be can we use IP VLAN or MAC VLAN rootless? The answer is well, no, but maybe. Like, it's it's the, the problem is this extra namespace. So if you would try to run Netherrack in this, well, it looks in this namespace and it's not finding your actual Ethernet interface and it, it cannot use it, like it would need actual privileges on the host. So what do you have in this rootless net NS by default? Well, basically nothing useful. So it, there's no point in trying to use Mac VLAN or IP VLAN rootless. But the kernel would allow it. Other questions? Yes? Uh, DNS or what? question is how does the DNS work if like there's a local cache on the host yeah so as rootless uh, not, not as rootless as rootful you have the problem or like the containers local host is, is different from the host local host right so if you try to connect to local host it's, it's not the same thing and and it wouldn't reach the DNS server so Portman by default strips out local host resolvers when it populates resolve.com for the container which means it wouldn't use the local cache on root. On rootless, on the other hand, since, since there's this extra process involved, it can reach the local host resolver cache on the, on the host, and we will use that on, on the rootless. So there, there's a special IP in rootless that tells, like, slip for NetNS and pasta to please use the host DNS. So it's it's reusing the same like any other unprivileged process, like what any process would do. So is, is the question like, can you have like a, a reverse proxy? Yeah, so, so with, with bridge, is, like the bridge mode is very suitable for a reverse proxy. Like uh, you forward the port into the reverse proxy container and from there you can have like your static definitions for your target and another container you could use the, if it's on the same network, you can use the name of the other container in your configuration for, for, for the reverse proxy. So the other container, like you don't need to know the IP address in advance, like configuration, it differs on host. So the, the best thing is like forward the port into the reverse proxy and then use the name for yeah, the, the RRAC DNS that is resolved for you. Okay, then if there are no other questions.
Thank you very much for your attendance.